I think the, the development challenges facing humanity are most complex in the coastal regions. Why? Partly because the richness and diversity of the coastal resources opportunities to support economic and social development are much greater than in the terrestrial environment or the purely marine environment. It is that interface between the sea and the land where we find the most complex, most rich, most diverse forms of natural resources. And they sustain many different forms of economic development. And that means that there's much competition for access to and often exclusive use of the coastal area and coastal resources. Now the challenge we face as managers is trying to maximize the potential use of these resources without damaging the ray resource base which creates those resources in the first place. You need integration in the sense that there are different economic and social groups wanting to have access to the coast. And what you have to do is try to treat them equitably so that everybody has an equal chance of the access to the resource, but without damaging the resource for other people to enjoy and use in effective ways. And that, that means that you have to get the different economic sectors to try to coordinate their activities so that they don't disrupt the potential flow of benefits from the coast without destroying the natural systems. And that's the challenge. And that's why we talk about integration, is integration of different economic sectors, different social demands for the coast, and different, different political systems trying to coordinate the development process more effectively. We're talking about development planning here. We're not talking about environmental conservation. The environmental conservation is one tool to manage the natural systems. Integrated coastal management is a set of principles to guide development planning. It is meant to create a, a working environment where people see that there are ways of doing things that are less environmentally damaging, more economically responsible, and create a greater social benefit. And that, that's difficult to get people to think about the environment, the economy, and social aspects in the same sentence. And that's what coastal management is trying to do. We're not trying to purely protect the environment. We're not trying to you know, maximize economic activities at the cost of social equity. These are complex concepts, and they have to be comp complex because we are dealing with very, very complex resource demands, very complex economic pressures, very complex social aspirations for how to use the coast. So in that sense, one of the problems we have is getting any political system to understand how complex the coastal resource pressures are, but also the great value of the coast, the strategic value of the coast in meeting social and economic pressures. And those pressures have to be managed. And the, the economic rationale behind that is that you can get greater social and economic benefits by wise management than you can by totally unregulated free-for-all development. And that's, that's the challenge, is convincing people that strategic value of the coast is, is important enough to invest in managing the coast effectively. And you know, for South Africa, for example, in developing the consensus-based national policy for the coast, it was very important to say to the government, look, 35% of gross domestic product is generated by the coast today. And as the natural resources in the interior of the country are exploited and decline, it is the coast that has the greatest opportunities for you to use in developing your economy, meeting your social objectives. But getting that message across, you often have to go back to economics to explain the strategic value of the coast and why investing in coastal management makes economic sense. And that is a big challenge. And we don't spend enough time doing that. The concept of integration, it's, it's a complex concept. And basically, it's something you work towards. It's a long-term goal. It's not something you can achieve overnight. And basically, we're talking about a process of strengthening development planning. And you do that by trying to get the different stakeholders, the different interest groups, to actually share an understanding of why the coast is important to each of them. 
So you're starting to build awareness. Awareness creates the basis of a dialogue between the different players in the coastal development game. Once you have cooperation and understanding of common issues, then you have the basis for creating not only cooperation, but a coordination of activities and, ac and actions that allow you to create a more sophisticated development planning system. And so awareness creates dialogue, dialogue creates cooperation, cooperation creates the basis for coordination of investment, of policy, of principles of management, and once you have those elements, then you're working towards the broader concept of integration. But integration is a long-term goal. Coastal management is a long-term process. You cannot create it in less than five to ten years, which seems a long time. But in the development of a society, five to ten years is a very important period in which to invest in improved development planning. But the problem is, you know, most political cycles go in five-year cycles. So people don't want to invest today in five years down the road because they don't see the payback. And that's why in coastal management, if we can create small-scale success fairly rapidly and show to people that there is a benefit from doing more integrated approaches to management of the coast and how people use the coast, those small-scale successes build confidence, build trust. Once you have the trust built, you have the basis for a stronger development of the concept into a, a very powerful development planning tool. For example, if you're looking about integration, you, you may want to have a coral reef used for protection of fisheries, the generation of you know, tourism, other types of activities. If it's carefully managed, you can have more than one activity in the same place at the same time, or more than one activity scheduled in different periods of time so that many different economic and social groups can, can gain from the use of that system. That's what we mean by integration. We're trying to find things that are complementary, which if well managed, can use the resource without degrading it. And that's a very important concept. That's integration at the intimate level. We're talking about integration perhaps at a policy level. That is a much higher level of integration. You don't have to have that instantaneously. You can have incremental success, build trust, build awareness, build dialogue, build cooperation. The, this is a process, and that's why we say it's much more important to try to evaluate the progress in developing a robust and durable pro coastal management process than trying to create the, the super refined, integrated coastal management strategy that everybody can sing and dance to today and tomorrow. It, it, it isn't like that. The term zone in integrated coastal zone management is meant to describe an area of special planning requirements, special development you know, concepts. It is meant not to say that you know, this is a kingdom in which the coastal manager is king. It's not meant to be that way at all. It's meant to describe an area of the land and sea surface where special planning and management techniques may be more appropriate than traditional, say, land use planning techniques. Because you're dealing with complex systems, you're dealing with systems that are very fragile, but at the same time highly biologically productive. So, in that sense, we talk about the zone to describe that area of the land and sea surface where these coastal systems, like estuaries, coral reefs, mangroves, whatever we want to call them, are found because they are there because of very, very powerful forces such as energy, nutrients and other types of inputs to the coastal zone from the upland areas and from marine areas. And that's why the coastal zone has unique coastal ecosystems, but all has, also has very, very complex social and economic systems. For example, many of our major sissies are located in the coastal zone. Why? Because the economic opportunities were there to locate people to find diversity of economic activities and so forth. So it is that combination of both the, the opportunities the coastal resources, coastal natural systems offer, plus all the opportunities that are created by social and economic development that make the development challenge so complex in that coastal zone. That's, that's one point. The other point is that if we treat the coastal zone as a very rigid area, then we forget that many things come down into the zone from the upland areas. For example, if we clear the forest in the Indonesian 
archipelago, then it's going to have a major change in the river systems in terms of flooding downstream, sediment, other things. So we need to think in a broader canvas than just the coastal zone. We need to think about the hydrologic influences, the economic influences that will influence how the coastal zone responds to human development pressure. And much of that human development pressure comes from outside the quote-unquote zone. But we use the term zone to define a, a general surface of the area of the coast where special planning and management might be required. But it, it, it is not meant to be restrictive. It's not meant to be a hard definition of a boundary. It, it's meant to be more a, a, a tool for building awareness that perhaps one area of the land surface is special and it needs different types of development planning techniques. Yes, people often ask the question, you know, at what scale should coastal management be you know, attempted? And I, I think it does d d depend very much on the political and economic system in which you're working. You often are able to achieve minor but powerful success at a local scale. The problem with that, unless there's some national recognition of the importance of the coast, then these local initiatives have no home, except at a local scale. If you think of the United States Coastal Management Act of, what, 1972, that was a very powerful instrument because it created a national policy framework and a set of technical tools and information tools to help the, the, the state-level governments create more effective management strategies for their coasts. It didn't dictate, it enabled. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an enabling environment. By Basically, it, it creates a home for coastal management at a national level without trying to dictate to the local level what should or should not be done. You allow the decision making at the local level because that's the most appropriate level. But it is very powerful if you have a national context which accepts and respects what happens at a more local level. And that's one of the problems, I think, with the European approach to coastal management. We had the European Commission undertake a very interesting series of pilot projects on coastal management. And those pilot projects, some 35 and 17 countries, were intended to be catalysts to show with seed money from the European government, or European uh, environment, uh, funding that would help local people solve local problems and therefore create demonstrations of the power of coastal management. But the problem is that the assumption was that the national governments would suddenly say, Eureka, coastal management is wonderful, we'll, we'll support it. But it didn't happen because the pilot projects were often too small and the communication that was achieved between the pilot project and, say, national government was often weak. And the European uh, Commission did not create an enabling environment. They didn't provide... Uh, a, a strong enough legislative basis for supporting coastal management as they did say for the birds or habitat directives. These were, these were requirements on the nation states to adhere to a standard of policy and planning that would affect birds and other species. But when it came to the more complex coastal systems, we never had that type of enabling environment. We, we assumed that by putting seed money into a project, the seed money would produce uh, much more tangible results at the national or regional scale. I think the European Commission should be commended for attempting to demonstrate how coastal management might be a better way of organizing human activities in the coastal realm. They saw it as a tool for reducing degradation of coastal areas. They saw it as a tool for improving the social and economic benefits from coastal development planning. The, the problem I see is that because the Commission thought that the UK might you know, veto a directive on coastal management, they, they backed off and they said, well, what options do we have? And they have you know, a series of options to, to try to encourage the member states to adopt more integrated coastal management. 
and they ended up with a council recommendation. It was recommended, advised, that all member states adopt the concepts and working principles of coastal management, integrated coastal management. But the problem is that you know, many member states didn't see the economic significance of that. And as a result, many of the local initiatives have just continued at a local level, or they have basically uh, dissolved because they didn't have ongoing support. They didn't have ongoing recognition of the benefits they were creating. But at the same time, there are some very, very fine examples in Europe of integrated coastal management at a local level, which is solving problems. When the European Commission started the demonstration program, they recognized that 70% of the European coastal realm had been damaged by poor planning and management. And they recognized that sectoral planning was no solution. That was, that was what was causing many of the problems. And that's why they were saying integrated coastal management is much, much better than just sector by sector planning and management of development. One of the problems is that most of our development planning systems are focused on individual economic sectors. Ministry of Industry, Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of Fisheries, Ministry of Agriculture. And what, what happens when you come to the coast is you'll, you'll find something like the mangrove forest sustains part of the fishery stock we wish to harvest. So if we do something in forestry which reduces the fisheries support function of the mangrove, then we're harming the economic sector known as fisheries. And this is where you know, a more integrated approach shows that by better management of the forest system or the agricultural system, whatever it's going to be, can have economic benefits to another sector. And that's, that's really where the whole basis of improving policy comes from, is reducing the negative effects and perhaps improving the economic potential of using coastal areas for more than one use by more than one agency at more than one time. And that's where, when we talk about a lead agency, a lead agency isn't trying to take power away from any one sector. It's trying perhaps to organize a dialogue between the different sectors to show how a more integrated approach might reduce the negative economic effects and allow those individual agencies to meet their mandates in a more effective manner. And that's, that's really what we're talking about. We're not talking about taking power away from any agency. We're talking about making those agencies perhaps more aware of the negative effects of poor planning and management and how minute, often discrete changes in management practices can have significant environmental, economic and social benefits. In many cases, we have learned very valuable lessons about how to make coastal management work effectively. We haven't been that good in communicating those lessons to a wider audience. And that, that's a real challenge for us. And so we have to get out of our academic ivory towers. We, we have to you know, learn to speak a language that is much more effective in communicating. And economics is one. You know, social dependence is another one. Issues like food security are another issue that needs to be brought into the equation. Because in many cases, our future depends upon the improved use of coastal areas. And if we don't start doing it now, our future is going to be weaker. We're going to have many more challenges to face, like food security, which are going to undermine the durable development of individual societies. So in that sense, because of the strategic value of our coasts in national and you know, other levels of development, we need to invest in coastal management, but we need to communicate coastal management as a practical way of doing things, an improved way of developing uh, economic, social, and other development plans. So coastal management, to me, still, after 40 years, is a powerful tool that needs to be elaborated, it needs to be communicated, it needs to be demonstrated at a, in a much more effective manner. I don't know, Ricky. I'm not sure that I've said anything that's very sensible. <laughs>